Welcome to Components of the Healthcare Information System or Hospital Information System. Both of these systems are organizational wide. They contain two major components and that's your clinical information system or your administrative information system. Clinical supports patient care, think of clinical things, nursing staff, physicians. Administrative supports the billing and registration processes. So clinical information systems, we've got nursing, we've got order entry, also known as um, physician order entry or provider order entry, monitoring, lab, pharmacy, radiology, anything you can think of that is clinical. Administrative is your client management or registration, financial, payroll, human resources, quality assurance. All of these things are intermixed and dependent on each other. We can't take care of the patient until we can get them registered properly. We can't monitor the patient in the clinical system unless the ADT interfaces from the registration system are populating those monitoring devices. We can't do risk management and quality insurance without the clinical documentation because that's what we're doing the risk management and quality assurance on and process improvement. So nursing information systems. These systems often use what's called the nursing process approach, which is based on traditional documentation. So if you think about the way nurses chart, we date and time and then we write. We date and time and then we write. We have flow charting, which is flow sheet type charting where we might be, um, think of a big spreadsheet where we're just checking boxes at certain times of the day to say that we have checked on the patient. Um, all of those nursing process approach, that's how most clinical information systems are built or nursing information systems. And we try to use standardized nursing languages. And whenever we talk about standardized nursing languages, we're talking about um, a set of taxonomy or nomenclature, you'll hear that word. And it has to do with trying to standardize what we say. Is it chest pain versus heart attack versus myocardial infarction versus angina? All of those things could be interchanged and changed in some form, but yet they are very different. And so it's having standardized languages. And some of those that are recognized are in your reading on page 142 of the reading this week. And that's NANDA or the North American Nursing Diagnosis Association. Um, there's NIC and NOC, which is Nursing Intervention Classification and Nursing Outcome Classification. Um, systems nomenclature of medicine CT, and you'll see that referred to as SNOMED CT, and we use that a lot. In the nursing world, we technically are not allowed to provide a medical diagnosis. Now, there's a fine line. If you are dyspneic, you are short of breath, you're having trouble breathing. Dysp being Latin for um, irregular or um, dysfunctional, think of it that way, and apneic or PNEIC, that is for uh, respiratory air. So you're without air or difficulty with air, and that is technically a diagnosis, but it's also a medical terminology. And so we're allowed to say a patient is dyspneic. What we're not allowed to do is technically is, is medically diagnose you. And so we use a lot of languages like SNOMED that are not directly associated oftentimes to an ICD-9 or diagnosis code. Although the terminology may say the same because we're speaking in medical terms, it's understood that when we're using SNOMED, it's not a diagnosis. A critical pathways or protocols approach, um, usually for multidisciplinary, may include um, provider or physician orders. And those kinds of protocols and critical pathways are going to be the things that think of your algorithms like in your workflow. It's the same thing with, say, orders. If the patient has this diagnosis, then order these tests. If any of those tests come back positive, then order these tests or, or exams. If any of those come back with this finding, do this. If it comes back with this finding, then do that. Some of those clinical decision support systems are using these critical pathways that say we should do XYZ for patients that have these similar issues because that's standardizing care and we want to, although everybody's an individual, we want to make sure they're getting a minimum set of care and then expand on that from there. 
So advantages of the nursing information system is improving access to information. So the documentation, if anybody's ever been in a hospital and seen paper charts, you've got the nurse trying to document what she needs, but the physician sitting at the desk reading and writing orders, and so she can't document or he can't document until the physician is done. And, and so then you put it in a napkin in your pocket, and then you spill your coffee on your lap, and then you've lost all your vital signs. So it's improved access, better documentation, improved quality of care, because now that that information resides as data, we can transform that data into knowledge and then into wisdom. So we can take the data components out and use them to improve um, quality of care because it's reportable and it's in a database. And tracking capabilities, enhanced regulatory compliance. We can see how many patients are at risk for falls. We can notify more people that the patient is at risk for falls because it's in a centralized location. Supports the use of documentation and nursing activities. So we have a thing at the hospital called the four Ps. Um, and you're going to catch me off guard with trying to remember what they are, but it has to do with rounding on the patient every hour because there's regulatory requirements that say we need to prove that we are providing safe care for our patients. It doesn't say how we do that. It tells us that we must prove that we are providing safe care. And so at our facility, we have to round on our patients every hour and we have to keep them safe by offering them um, toileting or potty. So that's one of the P's because one of the number one risks of falls are people with some sort of illness on pain medications who are dizzy or not feeling well, who are trying to get to a bathroom and they need to go to the bathroom and they really should have help to get to the bathroom. But if they don't get help going to the bathroom, they're going to try to go on their own and potentially fall or trip getting out of the bed, or, or maybe tangled up in IV lines and oxygen tubing. So by um, saying that we're going to offer the bathroom to these people at least once an hour, we hope to reduce the incidence of falls or injury. We offer them pain medicine, or check on their pain, I should say, once an hour. Ask them how they're feeling. Because again, if the person's laying there miserable and in pain, then that causes other things to happen. We reposition them for the same thing. It helps with their pain, but also repositioning can affect somebody that's more bedridden that can't move around and cause skin breakdown and sores and other complications and infections. So we do these four things, pain, potty, position, and I can't remember the fourth one, but we have told, um, it's our policy that we're going to do this every hour, and that is how when Joint Commission comes around, we are proving that we are one of the proofs that we're offering safe care to our patients. Um, so other activities and tools for managing the delivery of nursing care, we have automatic reminders now that something is due, whether that's a medication, whether that's a vital sign, whether there's some other activity that needs to be done. Maybe it's a dressing change that's only done once a day, and the, the notification comes up in the patient's chart or comes up on a work list for nursing so they don't forget to do these things and can do them more timely. And that's providing them access to this to um, online databases as well. So now when you're in the patient's room and you have a question about the medication they're on, you have an immediate way to get to that reference instead of going clear out to the med cart and pulling out the great big med book and trying to leaf through it. Clinical information systems support the provider with the order entry. So provider or physician or prescriber order entry, those are all the, the P's in CPOE. Um, provider order entry could be anyone from the physical therapist that needs to order durable medical equipment like watcher, walker or crutches to a physician that needs to put in lab orders. And, and um, it allows them to, re to retrieve those results and even provide notification to the provider that the results have come back. It allows them to be able to do their documentation so that the cardiologist that's down in the heart center, when they document the ICU hospitalist upstairs on the third floor, can automatically see what the results and the notes and documentation of that physician's exam and consult was without having to go find the patient's chart or walk down to the heart center and, and um, waste time looking for information. 
We talked a little bit about decision support, which is artificial intelligence that's used to enhance healthcare or augment healthcare. It is not meant to take away someone's brain, but remind us of some of the things with the changes in evidence-based MIP um, medicine that we might forget to do um, because it might be a, a rarer um, illness that the person has and we need a little bit of help. Um, monitoring systems. Any monitoring system is any device that can watch the patient and help gather and collect the information and automatically feed that into the clinical information system. So that could, most people will think directly of vital sign monitoring. So your blood pressure, your, your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your oxygen saturation, your um, heart tracing, all of those things are, are monitors. We also have TOCO monitors um, in community. It's called Fetal Link, and that is the contraction trending and tracing of a woman in labor and it also records her vital signs along with baby vital signs so the baby's heartbeat um, there's lots of other types of monitoring systems including some with cameras then there's alarm notifications um, that will alert providers that something abnormal is going on based on a set of ranges that have been configured within that monitor or within the clinical information system. It works both ways. The monitor itself can have an alarm set, but then it can also, within the documentation or within the clinical information system, display a warning or a different color to let you know that something abnormal is going off on the monitor. We need to be very careful about these types of alerts because we can get what's called alarm fatigue, alert fatigue, tasking fatigue, and pretty soon if it's constantly dinging, you start to ignore it. The next time you're in an emergency department, sit and listen. You'll hear lots of bells going off while nobody's running around because um, the patient moves and so it makes the alarm go off, but there's really not anything wrong with the patient. The one time you ignore it, it's going to be the one time there's something is wrong with the patient. Again, a little bit about the order entry system. Um, and again, CPOE, I want you to get really familiar with that term. And please, please, please know that that P is not just physician. I'm very partial to the word provider, but practitioner, uh, prescriber, but we have a lot of mid-level providers that are not specifically physicians. We have a lot of other people with provider order entry ability because of the types of orders that are being put into the system. Um, when these are ordered, what the the reward is for doing order entry is a, a couple different things. The first thing is order sets can be programmed so that with a few clicks you can order many, many, many orders. That can have some drawbacks. It can be dangerous if those order details or order sentences, whatever the phrase may be that you would like, um, doesn't get changed or isn't paid enough attention to, it's possible to place some orders in error. So you do have to be careful, but it does um, speed along the process to get some orders in. It also can increase safety as long as it's used appropriately because all of the things like medication doses, specific details that you don't want to miss about a lab draw so that it's done three times a day or the vital signs are recorded four times a day or six times a day. Those can be pre-programmed in the order so that it augments patient care down the road and it's not something the physician or provider has to remember to do. They're directly ordered into the system and then they also talk downstream. Not only is it there for clinical staff to see, but it also provides alerts and work lists in many other areas, whether that's in lab. It sends work lists to a, to a schedule for radiology or for special procedures so that they know that they have this type of patient and when the patient needs to be seen so they can schedule them appropriately and make sure they get all their resources. It can track this, um, start pulling supplies and tracking the necessary supplies for patients. So it's very powerful. It was originally started as that Institutes of Medicine initiative. And remember that big report in our very first lecture that they talked about. It eliminates transcription error. Uh, I have some examples in some other lecture slides that you just can't read the the writing and I don't know those of you that may have some clinical experience or been exposed to it you'll see things where they say you must always always put a zero in front of the decimal point whenever you're writing a decimal dose of a medication 
there's accepted standard abbreviations and it's very hard to use metric units because you end up with things that look like UG when it really was MG and there's a very distinct difference between those two. It's it's not seeing the M at all because of the way the doctor scribbled and, and giving somebody grams of medicine instead of milligrams of medicine or not seeing the MCG for micrograms and giving them a thousand times the dose. So it eliminates those transcription errors. It can expedite the treatment because it happens right now. So as soon as that enter button is pushed, then all of these other things can fire all at the same time. And it's not dependent on this person doing something before the next person can do something. And it encourages more accurate and complete orders. A complete order, I will give you a very good example. We have persons that go to surgery and back in the day, the physicians would say, continue home meds as prescribed. They never looked at the home meds necessarily, or did they take time to write each med out and realize that maybe they should change the dose on those medications? Now, with the more accurate and complete orders, they're looking at the home medications and verifying that yes, that patient really should go home on this med or they should continue taking this med. In addition, a complete med order for medications is the right route, the right patient, the right dose, the right medication. And so a lot of times if you think about uh, an order, take two aspirin and call me in the morning, that's not a complete order. The complete order is um, when you say two aspirin, it needs to be two tablets of 325 milligrams of aspirin taken by mouth every four hours. That's a complete medication order. And so it encourages that because we don't have to take the time to write it all out. It's already in there standardized. We just have to verify. Laboratory information systems reduce turnaround times, eliminate duplicate testing, and reduce errors. We talk about turnaround time. That is the time from the time the order is placed until the result comes back. And what this does is allows the physician to place an order which automatically will notify either a phlebotomist or um, a nursing staff of some sort or clinical staff to actually collect the specimen where before the physician would or provider would write it on a piece of paper then they'd stick it was inside the chart that would be put in a rack whenever the secretary had time to look at that chart and pull it out of the rack they would take the orders off the chart and enter them electronically into a system separately then put the rack back for the nurse to see that the orders were placed. And whenever the nurse came back for lunch or got done with a code brown or had the time, she would go up to the, he or she would go up to the central nursing station, see that this chart was now in this rack for orders to be taken off. They would open the chart, they would take the orders off, and oh, by the way, we've got to draw blood. So several hours sometimes could happen unless it was a stat order. This way, as soon as the, the order is put in, all the notifications go out. There's a notification on the nursing, task list that lets them know that there is a, a lab to be done and potentially a specimen to be drawn. It gives them the ability to print a label right there at the bedside and do positive patient identification. It will alert the lab that they should be receiving a specimen. So if it isn't received timely, they can call up and say, hey, did something go wrong? Do we need to come and get that? Eliminates duplicate testing. If a CBC was done in the ER and now it's two hours later and the patient's upstairs on the floor and the physician orders a CBC or provider, it'll alert them that one was already done. Do we really want to do a second one? Sometimes that answer is yes, but a lot of times it's no. And also reducing the errors, and we talked a little bit about those same things with um, laboratory tests, making sure we're getting the right test on the right patient at the right time with the right specimen. It's really frustrating to have somebody you're having a difficult time drawing blood out of and you finally get some blood and you put it in the tubes only to find out that they weren't the right tubes because you just had an order to draw blood but you weren't clear on what it was you needed. Radiology infra information systems or RIS is this is very similar to the lab it's allowing those orders to come into them it's allowing alerts to go out to people for preps so anybody that's ever been in radiology sometimes you need specific IV access sometimes you need to take specific preparatory medications whether that's drinking something uh, some sort of contrast whether that's having some other kind of prep to make you go out the other end whether it's pre-medications, a lot of people either need a sedative medication or potentially if you're diabetic, there's rules and protocols set around when you take your next 
diabetic medication versus when we gave you contracts. Those are all readily available now with alerts and warnings and reference tests text to help care for that patient the most efficient way and the safest way. Um, transcription of results, so again, it allows those results to come back in automatic as soon as the uh, exam is finished. So the radio, the exam is done, it's put in the digital PAC system, it's available online with a voice clip for the provider to listen to and visualize themselves. And when the radiologist is done with their report, it automatically displays that report. Um, the picture archiving and transmission issues of tracking of film gener is generated in the PAC system automatically. Um, and of course, then it can also augment with billing and charges so that they happen in a timely fashion. When you've got a 30-day billing cycle, you've got to get those bills into the system and out to insurers in a timely manner. Pharmacy information systems, we talked already a little bit about medications and how that happens. Now we have a complete order with provider order entry. We've got duplicate checking that's going to happen so the patient doesn't get two medications that are the same. We've got allergy checking and med-med interaction checking so that we don't give something somebody something they're allergic to and we don't give them something that they shouldn't have based on certain lab results. It also can track medication use, costs, billing, and we're moving to barcode med administration falls usually under the pharmacy information system. And barcode med administration is the positive patient ID at the bedside. So you have the drug in your hand, you have the patient in front of you, you scan the barcode on the drug, it tells you, yes, this is really aspirin. You scan the barcode on the patient. There's nothing in the system that says the patient can't have aspirin. So you can give, and it says, yes, this person is due this much type of aspirin that you have on your screen, and it allows you to give it. If you scan the medication and you had picked up ibuprofen instead, and the patient had an ibuprofen allergy, you pull up the patient's record, you scan the med, and all the bells and whistles go off and say, whoop, 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 don't give that medication. If that patient, you might be on the wrong patient's chart by accident, you scan the you get in the patient's chart, you scan the med, everything's fine. You scan the patient's arm band, it says, whoop, 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 that patient isn't scheduled to get that medication. So there's a lot of safety around it. Sometimes there's extra steps, but the end result downstream is usually more efficient and more cost effective for the hospital or healthcare organization overall. Some other things to think about are dispensing and robotic systems. So these robots actually can come around the units and, and deliver specialized medications such as IV fluids that have to be mixed downstairs and kept refrigerated and some things like that. And in the e-prescribing is a portion where the, the provider does provider order entry for the prescription. It electronically sends it to your pharmacy so that it's there and available for you and you don't have to worry about going out in the rainstorm with your prescription paper and getting it all wet and muddy and not having the ability to get your medications. And then we talked a little bit more about the barcoding. It's more about e-prescribing. One of the nice things about it is uh, formulary compliance checks for reimbursement. So there are some medications that are more cost effective than others. Generates reminders for home medications at discharge that we need to, to reorder those potentially. Eliminates phone authorizations for refills. Well, there's a little bit of discussion about that. In the state of Montana, we still have to have paper prescriptions for schedule um, two narcotic drugs. So there's still some of that that happens. And of course, the drug-drug interactions as well. Physician practice management systems. These are usually used in the physician or provider clinic area or in their office. And it is a combination of a health information system and that registration or administrative system. And it, a lot of practice management systems have additional administrative type functions that are scaled down for practice. So at the hospital level, tracking supplies, tracking inventory, tracking pharmacy, tracking number of patients, tra tracking quality risk management, this is broken down into a little bit smaller scale that may or may not connect to the main hospital, but maintains records electronically and helps with scheduling, billing, some order entry, um, tracking usage, and other things to help them run their business. Home health care systems work very similarly to the hospital system. They may or may not be integrated depending on the type of institution or the relationship between the two institutions. 
Um, there can be this excessive documentation because home health care systems function differently than hospitals. Um, rehab systems function differently. There's different reporting mechanisms that need to go out to the state and, and other government type agencies. It improves the payment for services because it's easier and quicker to find the information needed for billing because sometimes those um, information pieces again are more specific to the, the type of care and the way things have to be reported. And, and similarly with long-term health care systems, um, the home health out in the home could be one of those group homes as we talked about or some other form of going back and forth and there's a lot of tracking on the, the home health system with providers going in and out of patients' homes, where the long-term healthcare system also has more regulations and more government um, oversight. Um, although they may not be as heightened clinically sometimes, it is necessary. A lot You have a lot of polypharm. There's big issues with integrating with the hospital systems to know what the patient was given while they were there because they come back to the long-term healthcare facility with a whole different slew of medications. It's important that they have access to what was done with the patient because oftentimes these people in long-term healthcare systems don't have an advocate or someone else who can help describe what happened to them while they're in the hospital and they're unable to speak for themselves. Registration systems. The, these we talked about the admission, discharge, and transfer or ADT interface. This is huge. This HL7 interface hyper markup language, hyper language HL7. Boy, you just caught me on a link. Um, the HL7 language that's used for the ADT interfaces is very specific and it's standardized to be used across multi-systems. And so getting your, your patient name, as I talked about before, into the monitor, from the monitor back into the clinical information system, all of that is managed by HL7 and an ADT interface. So it's critical for patient identification and reimbursement. And mobile computing is all the rage, right? It's everything from your smartphone being able to do um, lookups on drugs to being able to show you advanced cardiac life support algorithms or ACLS or CPR algorithms. It allows you to do point of care testing. It allows you to uh, take an iPad into the patient's room and show them what their x-ray images look like. Documentation right at the bedside, it's immediate, it's instant. If, if you get old like me and you've ever had a conversation with somebody and you walk out of the room and five minutes later you can't remember what you talked about, it allows you to do that type of documentation right at the bedside. As you watched in the earlier video about the black with the person with the BlackBerry phone, there's also security concerns. There's concerns that these devices will walk off and be stolen. There's concerns that if it is a personal mobile device that you would have um, patient protected information or PHI, protected health information, available on that phone. And so it's very important from um, the health information technology standpoint that we have things in place to lock that down or to make up for that. And so just like in the BlackBerry video at our hospital, I have an iPhone that's supplied to me by the, the hospital. And the moment I report that it is missing, they can nuke the phone and everything that's on it and it's wiped clean so that it can't be used maliciously to access the hospital information system or to see any of the emails or data on my phone that may contain protected health information. Other things that we've talked about in some of the earlier lectures have to do with radio frequency ID or RFID, global positioning system or GPS systems that can track these devices. These are all um, part of the monitoring and also the mobile computing and how health information technology can stay on top of everything from the viruses to the latest technology to manage these system, manage these devices, track these devices, secure these devices, um, prevent users from logging into them as somebody else and documenting inappropriately as somebody else, even if it's an error. And that is the end of this lecture. I apologize for the reading. Um,